Hi, Crash Course Physics episode 5 is out. This week's topic were Newton's three laws of motion. I'm here to convince you that there is in actuality only one law of motion if we take a step back and look at a more fundamental property, momentum. The momentum P of an object is its mass times velocity, in classical mechanics anyway. So the faster you're moving, the more momentum you have, and the more stuff is moving, the more momentum it carries. In one-dimensional motion, momentum can be positive or negative, and if you are moving in more than one direction, it is a vector. Its unit is kilograms times meters per second. And here is the one law of motion. Momentum is conserved. That means it cannot be created nor destroyed. A single object's momentum can change, but not the total amount of momentum of all objects together. Newton's first law says that an object does not change its velocity, that is, its momentum, on its own. It is moving uniformly along a straight line, unless something else acts on it. That is your hockey puck on frictionless ice. The second law says that an object's state of motion, in other words, its momentum, changes by means of forces. In a sense, that is the definition of force. Force is the rate of change of momentum. Over a short amount of time dt, a force f causes a change in momentum dp equals f times dt. When several forces act on an object, the corresponding changes in momentum add up. When they cancel each other out, an unmoving object stays put. This is called static equilibrium. The unit of force is momentum per second, so kilograms times meters per second squared or Newton. Finally, Newton's third law states that forces between objects always come in pairs of equal magnitude but opposite direction. If we think of momentum transferred from one object to another, whatever amount of momentum the first object gains from the second, the second must have lost, precisely because momentum can only be exchanged and never appears out of nowhere nor disappears into nowhere. Now you might ask, wait a minute. Where is the opposing force in the case of gravity? It is there. An object exerts an equal and opposite force of gravity on the ground. The momentum gained by the object comes from the Earth, which is gaining the same amount of momentum in the opposite direction. But as the Earth is so incomparably more massive than the object, the resulting change in velocity is imperceptibly small. Now let's look at horizontal motion. A car or deer, gets moving by pumping momentum out of the ground. The ground experiences an equal and opposite force. We cannot push harder against the ground than the ground pushes against us, just as with normal force. But these two forces don't cancel each other out because they act on different things. The traction acts on the deer, giving it forward momentum, and the static friction acts on the ground, giving it an equal amount of counter momentum. You can see this counter momentum when the ground is very light itself or as the recoil of a bow. So the force of traction and the ground's reaction to it represent a flow of momentum from the ground into the deer. A split second later, the rope tightens and part of the deer's momentum is imparted onto the sleigh. This momentum flow is again usually thought of as a force pair acting along the rope. Finally, the moving sleigh exerts a force of friction back onto the ground, making it lose momentum. The whole circuit always has a total momentum of zero. While the deer accelerates, it and the sleigh gain momentum at the expense of the ground, because the deer can extract more out of the ground than the sleigh loses back into it. In equilibrium, the deer's traction is just big enough to counteract the sleigh's losses by friction, and both move at a constant velocity. Since momentum is something which can neither be created nor destroyed, its exchange between objects bears some similarity to a liquid distributed between various containers. The product P equals M times V corresponds to the volume contained in a box of width M and height V. The wider the box, the slower its gauge rises to a given flow rate pouring in. Just as a more massive object accelerates less given the same amount of force. In the case of the lift with a counterweight, the connecting cable makes that the velocities are always the same, 
except for direction. It therefore acts like a connecting valve between two momentum reservoirs, which makes momentum flow from one to the other until the levels are the same. The force of gravity now provides a constant influx of momentum into the elevator at a rate of approximately 10,000 newtons. At the same time, the counterweight experiences an outflux of some 8,500 newtons. Momentum is flowing out because we are measuring it along the opposite direction. At the level of the rope, the force of gravity are actually pointing in opposite directions. Therefore, both reservoirs see a net influx of 1,500 newtons, which are divided up according to their masses because of the connecting valve that is the rope. The resulting acceleration, or rate of change of the velocity gauge, is the net influx divided by the total mass. It is worth noting that the concept of momentum predates Newton's theory of forces. His laws were, in a sense, already known. Nowadays, there is talk of the four fundamental forces. Except that particle physicists have gone back to thinking more in terms of momentum and how it is being exchanged between colliding particles. I hope this glimpse into an alternative perspective on the laws of motion was insightful. If you enjoyed this video, please like it. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.